Let me remind you of our format. We will now have uh, brief presentations from two discussants, which will then be followed by a, a, a long and I'm sure very interesting question and answer session. Uh, so if many of us in this room might consider ourselves uh, the, uh, the heirs of the artist period in Russian literature, uh, however modest we are as heirs, it is now time to turn to the heirs of those heirs. And I would like to present to you uh, two very, very able and um, promising young scholars from our graduate program in Slavic languages and literatures. Um, I'll introduce them both, I think, uh, together. Uh, Natalie McCauley, who's a PhD student in our program, and Sarah Sutter, who is too. Natalie and Sarah have been given the um, onerous responsibility of responding in detail to these four very, very different papers on a very wide range of subjects. But they also have the opportunity, of course, to bring us a very different we have to admit, I think, most of us in this room, generational perspective. And so it is great with great pleasure that I introduce first Natalie McCauley, PhD student in Slavic languages and literatures at this university. Natasha, please take the podium. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank our panelists for their fascinating and compelling papers today. Each of them was informative, insightful, and thought-provoking, and will undoubtedly lead to a productive and thoughtful discussion. Were he around today, I'm sure that Carl Proffer would be honored and complimented to hear all of these presentations. To begin the discussion, I have two questions for two presenters each, followed by one question for all four presenters. First of all, I would like to ask about the presentations of Professors Reynolds and Lipovetsky, as both of these works deal with how artist publications helped to form the canon of Russian literature, not only through the works written in the first half of the 20th century and during their initial time of publication with artists, but again in the 1980s when those same works that could not have been published during the Soviet Union were finally allowed during the period of Glasnost. Professor Lipovetsky's project explores the prose canon set by artists and Professor Reynolds' project discusses the poetry canon and then furthermore the process of canonization itself. Specifically, Professor Reynolds spoke of how contemporary poets were able to be fully appreciated in large part because their readers had been introduced via artists to the golden and silver-aged poets who inspired them. Professor Lipovetsky noted that one of the ways the proffers were able to connect their audience to the artist writers was by creating a bridge between their works in modernism to the earlier works during the golden ages, such as connecting Pushkin to Nabokov and Svetayeva. This question then is open to both professors Reynolds and Professor uh, both Professor Reynolds and Lipovetsky. Do you think that there was something specific about Russian moders modernism, or at least how these intellectual circles longed for modernism, that, that allowed such a connection to be made? That is, was the success of this bridge a result of the growing popularity of modernism in Russia, or was there specifically in these modernist pieces that allowed such resonance among artist readers. Secondly, I noticed a connection between Professor Kozlov's paper and Professor Reynolds in the description of the widely held ideologies of the time and their effect on literary canons. Professor Kozlov describes the events leading up to the founding of artist, artist publications, specifically the journey of the literary journal Novi Mir through Soviet censor, censorship that helped set the scene for artists' first years of existence. Indeed, we cannot understand the importance of artists without first understanding the political environment that brought about its creation. But my question deals specifically with the description of the political environment in which artists found itself when created and the ambiguous or seemingly contradictory ideological boundaries of much of the 1960s Soviet culture. For example, and Professor Kozlov goes into more detail in his paper, that one could be all for democracy, political reforms, and critical realism literature in Novi Mir, and at the same time feel a deep patriotism to the Soviet Union. So my question is, how, if at all, do you think this combination was reflected in the literature of the time that was soon to be published in artists? Did artist literature show that these ideologies could be held simultaneously, or was this something more or less inaccessible to the Western audience? And lastly, I have a question for all four presenters. As a young scholar who is interested primarily in Russian women's writing, 
And given that artists published so many famous women writers, I would like to ask about the specific and unique role that women had in artist publications and the canon large, largely formed by artists. As Beth Holmgren has noticed, noted, many of the most successful women writers of the time were not necessarily seen as writers in their own right, but rather as widows of famous writers, such as Osip Mandelstam's Nadezhda Yakovlevna, who later became a writer after her husband's death. If you could, please expand on the role specifically that women played in artist publications, how they helped to form the poetry and prose canons, how their works helped bridge the audience to the golden era, um, and what unique features their works contributed to artist anthologies. Thanks. So our presenters will have a chance to answer Natasha's questions in just a moment. But before that, I'd like to invite our second um, discussant, our second and last discussant, Sarah Sutter, uh, to take the podium. She is also a PhD candidate in Slavic languages and literatures at this university. Sarah, the podium is yours. So I would also like to thank the presenters for their interesting papers. Uh, the range of issues covered provides us with a more comprehensive understanding of artist publishing. And I agree with Natalie that today's panel will no doubt inspire a great discussion to begin the symposium. I just have a few thoughts and questions of my own to add before we get into the discussion. Professor Kozlov spoke of a noticeable shift in the Soviet readership. The readers in the late 60s were more likely to employ rhetoric about legality and democracy and to speak more openly about their experiences of terror, even as Brezhnev's regime brought about renewed ideological suppression. My questions are about how this shift later affected the Soviet readers' attitudes toward artist publications and other Soviet works published abroad. Did the readership of Novimir turn to other avenues for literature after the drastic changes to the publisher's editorial board? How did readers' concern over literary suppression manifest itself in terms of where they were looking for literature and how they were responding to literature in the period immediately following the Novimir upheaval. Professors Lipovetsky and Reynolds discussed the artist selection processes for its prose and poetry publications, respectively. Both of them also mentioned contrasts between the Russian language versus English translation output of artists. I would like to hear more about how the balancing of Soviet and Western audiences impacted the proffer's work. The proffers essentially belonged to two different publishing worlds and were trying to simultaneously meet the perceived needs of both. How did this play out given their limited means as well as the social and political environments of the Soviet Union and the US? I would like to hear the presenters' thoughts on the insider versus outsider roles the proffers played in their endeavors. We heard from presenters about some of the personal relationships that the proffers maintained with Nabokov, Brodsky, Sokolov, and other authors. We also heard about major impulses that informed the selection criteria for artists. I've recently been reading some of the academic reviews of artist publications, primarily of the artist anthologies, and several of the reviews were highly critical of the selection of authors, the omission of certain authors, the organization of material, the translation quality, the introductory notes for authors, and in general, the academic rigor of these works. I'm wondering how the proffer's personal relationships and commitments caused some of their publications to clash with academic expectations or trends of the time. And then one last line of thought involves the future of the proffer's legacy. I saw that Overlook Press, which is the press that bought several English language titles of artists and the artist publishing name in 2002, they announced a huge canonization project called the Russian Library. And starting in 2014, they will publish over 125 volumes of English translations over the next 10 years, with a focus on lesser known works. So I'd be interested to learn how the presenters think the artist's legacy affects contemporary Western publishers of Russian literature in translation, and particularly what of the artist's legacy can we expect to see in the canonization project of Overlook Press. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. In fact, you've uh, sat down, I think, too early, Sarah, because I think the intention of our organizers now is that all the presenters and the discussants should occupy their places marked here. I hope that's correct, Professor Mayorova. Have I understood that correctly? We will turn on these microphones, uh, and we will begin our question and answer session. I think we should probably begin by asking our presenters to talk uh, briefly in response to the remarks made by the discussants, and then we will open it to the floor. When we do open discussion to the floor, uh, I believe that this is the microphone that um, 
That was a questioning intonation. I hope you understood. <laughs> this, this, is the, this is the microphone that I would ask people to uh, come up to. And when, first of all, our, our, I'll give our presenters a moment to sit down, but I'll explain that once they have answered the questions posed by our discussants, uh, the floor is open to questions from everyone in the audience. Bear in mind, again, that we are live uh, uh, streamed. When you come up, I would be grateful if you would introduce yourselves if you wish to announce an academic affiliation, bear in mind that although we have a lot of famous people in this audience, we do also have a lot of very young people in this audience who may not recognize the famous people in the audience, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, if you wish to announce your academic affiliation, please do so. But if you don't, that's fine. But it would be nice if you would announce your name at least first before asking a question. But before we do that, may I simply turn to our, um, our panelists and ask them to respond to our discussants. Um, is there an order that anyone, everyone would like to go in, or, or should we just go from, from right to left? In the order of presentation. Oh, in the order of presentation, let's do that then. So, Professor Delinim, would you be kind enough to respond first to the remarks made just now? Well, uh, uh, now I, I know uh, how Prince Vyazimsky felt when he read Tolstoy's War and Peace. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my knowledge of the epoch that was discussed is mostly anecdotal. And uh, I remember pretty well many of the men and women that were, 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 were mentioned in, uh, in uh, uh, your papers. And I, while well, just not responding to the presenters, but I want to, 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 to say something uh, uh, in this respect. First, I, I can give an answer again, an anecdotal, to the uh, question that Andrew Reynolds asked, uh, what prevailed or what dominated poetry or prose? Again, an anecdotal answer. When in 1963, I came to the Leningrad Palace of Young Pioneers and joined the literary club there uh, Dirzania, it was the name, and there were a lot of future poets and uh, critics there. Uh, the, the, the section of poetry had about 30, 35 members. The section of prose had only three, me included. <laughs> so, it, again, the same, the same, the same uh, happened during my, our student years. In, in the philological faculty, Tanya, Tanya is smiling. We, we studied together in high school and the university. So again, again, the number of poets was much, much, much more uh, 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 impressive than a number of prose writers. I remember only Bielowlanowska, and that's it. Uh, 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 and a lot of poets, a lot of poets. Lena Schwartz started then, uh, and uh, yes, yes, Sergei Stratonovsky, of course, was there. And uh, well, uh, really, really scores of aspiring poets. And this uh, tells us something about, about uh, this dominance of poetry in the mind of young people of my generation. Well, uh, now, if, if to, to, again, to go back to, to, to those years and uh, try to answer the question about gender or men and women or women and men, I would tell you that nobody thought about that in those terms at that time. There were no men and women as far as literature was concerned. This, this distinction was important in other areas of our life, but we don't discuss them here. Uh, uh, as for poetry or writing or prose writing, there were writers and poets, and uh, no more and no less. Uh, and the third thing I wanted to say is uh, about this uh, Novy Mir, Novy Mir uh, fascinating history. Again, as a reader of Novy Mir, uh, uh, an avid reader of Novy Mir, I, I, I would say that from the point of view of the insider and the witness, the situation was much, much more nuanced and uh, 
complicated than what you presented. First, we must keep in mind that actually intelligentsia, well, the, 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 the the young intelligentsia, the members of the group to which we belonged, would never think of writing a letter to Novimir. Never. <laughs> Nobody would ever think of that. It would be idiotic, you know. So when, when you rely on data uh, only f taken from those letters, you must remember that it actually is limited and it doesn't give a representative a representative uh, 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 information about the responses to Novimir. Uh, as for foreign influences and the language that is foreign uh, uh, to, 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 to the masses, and again, of course, to intelligence, again, an anecdotal uh, 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 example. Uh, well, the influence of foreign radio stations was incredible, and people would listen, uh, people from all the strata of the society would listen, if it was possible, to, to, to Svoboda or to Golis Amerike, BBC, Anatoly Maximovich Goldberg was a hero. Uh, uh, he was a political commentator of BBC, Russian service. Uh, when I uh, went to, 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 to Kartoshka, uh, to Kalkhoz, uh, in something like 1970, and I stayed, I rented a room from, 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 from a peasant there. He was blind, so he didn't have to go to work a lot. The first thing he did at 6 o'clock, he turned on his radio, and it was Svoboda. And he would listen to Svoboda all day long, loudly, and all the village w w would listen to Svoboda. So <laughs> uh, uh, it means that this language language of Russian immigration, still there were a lot of Russian emigre working then uh, on Svoboda, uh, uh, w w was understandable, it was comprehens uh, c comprehended by the masses, and uh, uh, even, even by the masses uh, in Kilhuas, not only, of course, uh, by intelligence. And, uh, well, the, the, the influence of foreign Western mentality was great. Actually, actually, uh, I, I started studying English in order to read uh, newspapers and journals and forbidden books in English. It was easier than to get something. So again, don't exaggerate this national impulse against, uh, among intelligentsia. Actually, nationalist, nationalist mentality comes later than 60s. And uh, well, we, we, we should remember that uh, Bilov, for example, Vasily Bilov, published his Plotnitsky Raskazy in Novy Mir, not in Moscow and not in Nashvimenik, right? So it was still, 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 uh, still non-existent, I would say, in nationalist mentality in the 60s. It would, would develop later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dalin. Uh, Professor Kozlov, would you like to take up the baton? Sure, uh, sure. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank both Natalie and Sarah. Could you speak Sarah. into the microphone, please? Um, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to thank both Natalie and Sarah for their very interesting questions, and actually a very uh, complicated question, each of them, is um, about the relationship, the complexity uh, that I address in the paper, that both sets of mind could coexist in one and the same person, aspiration toward democracy and legality, and uh, uh, a certain degree of nativism and patriotism, and how, if at all, this could be reflected in the literature published by artists. Well, uh, if you look at this program here, which is a fairly comprehensive list of the publications, just to give you one example, uh, memoirs by Kopilev, Lev Kopilev, and Raisa Arlova as well, where they fully address and analyze this very complexity. And they actually address their own evolution from, a, from believers to non-believers, and all of the aspects of that evolution, including, by the way, patriotism and Soviet patriotism there too, and how this evolved over time, over decades, in fact. So that's a wonderful example, published by artists. Actually, several texts published there. Um, 
In response to uh, Sarah's question about the um, terror and how this um, had an impact on readers' reception of uh, literature in the 1970s, including the publications of artists, um, well, terror went into the subtext of uh, Soviet culture in uh, many ways. And uh, yet another example from the same catalog. Take Trifonov's Dom na Nabirizhny, House in the Embankment, right? And that's a perfect example of it going into the subtext. It's, it's, it's very rich in its allusions, and yet the allusions are indirect. The reader has to be familiar with what is going on, with what is being talked about, with the topic. There is uh, a lot not mentioned, a lot of understatement in the book. And that understatement was characteristic, and this is one of the very foundational texts of the Soviet culture in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, and then, of course, all of this would uh, uh, come back to us in the mid-80s and late 80s during the perestroika. And if I may, I'd like to respond to Professor Delinian's comments. Um, well, uh, uh, may I ask you, first of all, why would you not write a letter to Novimir in those years, and why would you consider that idiotic? Um, uh, it's not representative, no, statistically speaking. Um, if you, we look at the archive of Novimir, no, it's not representative. And it's impossible to find anything representative uh, as historical evidence, because the evidence is by nature fragmentary. But nonetheless, the archive does contain about 12,000 readers' letters including letters by extremely well-educated people, uh, Dmitry Sergeyevich Lihachov and others. I'm not talking about rank-and-file uh, uh, readers, and most of them were rank-and-file. Uh, and uh, while not statistically representative, it is uh, one of the best sets of evidence we have, and we need to work with what we have, right? Um, and about nationalism, oh yes, of course, nationalism um, rose to the peak, to the apex of its, of its uh, power later. But already in the 60s, it was there. And if you look at the publications by you know, Labanov and Chelmayev and all the others, uh, those were already there in the n n late 1960s. So it was a nascent trend. And I fully agree with you that it was not yet there quite fully. But it was on the rise. And uh, people as sensitive as the editors of Novimir certainly noticed it. Uh, the way they noticed it was uh, a bit problematic, but they did. So I'll then pass the torch over to Mark. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. <clears throat> I, I just, uh, and probably uh, Andrew is over there, um, Andrew would agree with me that um, neither me nor him, we, we didn't analyze the process of selection. We, we, we cannot analyze the process of selection. We know nothing about it. So we, we actually analyzed the results of the selection, and uh, if we are talking about this canon, obviously it was not formed intentionally. That that's the sort of spontaneous or practical canon that canon that emerged as a result of the artist's work. And uh, certainly we should we should remember that this was a group effort, and Andreas' role in this process is, should, should should be emphasized as much as possible. Right. Uh, as to the, the to Natalia's question about the bridge, was it sort of specific to Russian modernism or was it specific to social condition? I think it was specific more uh, to social condition because uh, we, we, the greatest number of works published um, by artists, especially from the 1910th from 1910th to 1930s, were the works which were not available to Russian readers at all. Many of them were not known. Many of them were, were just discovered, like Platonov's plays, for example. Right? Uh, as we remember, artist was becoming with reprints of the older books, which which were again not available. So it was just filling this this huge cultural gap that existed between uh, Russian classics, which was well sort of present uh, in the cultural horizon, right? And and today's uh, period. And in many ways, I think that that uh, there were two impulses here. On the one hand, uh, the, this huge heritage of Russian modernism. On the other hand, the rebirth of this modernism in underground art. And this resonance created the need to, to connect these two, two ends. And uh, as to Gogol, Pushkin, and others, they served to, as, as the cultural legitimacy for both parts of this project. But certainly, in my view, modernism and underground were on the forefront while 
Pushkin and Gogol were holding the, the sort of the, the fort. Right. Um, the uh, women's writers role, uh, you see, looking at, at my, my summary of the list, I, I wouldn't say that there were uh, so many women's writers uh, among, among um, publications in contemporary literature. The most, most prominently is represented in Navarlamova, uh, who, was, who was published in Russian and in English and included into anthologies. And, and she is a very interesting writer. And uh, it's regretfully that, that she's forgotten today. Uh, but certainly she is not as important for the fiction of artists as, as Sokolov or even Aksyonov. On the other hand, who are really important, and, and Denis Horst has already mentioned these names, are uh, Nadezhda Mandelstam and Reis Arlo. And uh, I, I would disagree with Beth Holmgren that, that uh, Nadezhda Mandelstam's uh, fame, at least for artists, was because she was a widow of Mandelstam. If you read uh, Prophet's memoirs about Mandelstam, it's quite obvious that she uh, became the, 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 the figure of great importance exactly as the one who, who sort of brought the modernist mind to, to the contemporary period. Uh, she was important for him as the ideologue who was creating cultural policy around him. And certainly she was important as the writer of fascinating books, fascinating in its own right. And uh, uh, Prophet argues in, the, in that memoir that, that all this debate around the second book of her memoirs is actually misleading because she is much more independent as the writer in these books. It's a much greater literature than the first one, which was more, more memoiristic. And in the second one, she is a writer on, on her own right. So, so uh, when I was talking about this ethical dimension of uh, modernist canon, I think that, that it stems mainly from Mandelstam and Tarlova. They were the, 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 the thinkers that defined that canon. And that's, that's the role to answer your question. Um, about the difference between Russian and English publications, I think it's quite obvious, and, and I mentioned that English language publications were uh, intended to combine best of underground literature with the best of Soviet literature, of Soviet literature, and that's why, for instance, it included books of uh, such writers which were broadly published in the Soviet Union, for instance, Abramov, uh, Nagibin, Shukshin, Trifonov, Iskander was less published, but he was well published as well, right? So it was it was sort of the the, the combined, uh, you know, of Russian literature in its in its both wings, so to speak, <laughs> right? Uh, while of course uh, Russian publications were filling the gaps. Uh, as to the influence of Ardis's canon on contemporary Russian canon. I think it would be a fascinating task for a graduate student uh, to, to put this wonderful brochure against the list of these books in the Russian 100 and to compare it. I'm not prepared to answer this question. It, it requires a special research of the next generation of scholars. Thank you. Professor Wells. Okay. I'd also like to thank uh, Natalie and Sarah for their very interesting uh, questions. Um, Yes, so just to build on, I think, what uh, Mark was saying, uh, as, as we know, uh, a lot of these themes can come together because it was a deep dish to Mandelstam, giving them the copy of Stone that uh, is both the, you know, the bridge, if you like, with, you know, personally Mandelstam and then also with the whole uh, Silver Age tradition. Uh, and um, I, I also think it is, you know, the, the most important connection is with modernism per se, but of course particularly with, you know, the Acmeus tradition, which at this time, also in the 70s, was uh, um, at the heart of some of the most interesting literary, uh, uh, literary criticism, obviously, with, yeah. Yeah, okay. with, with the study of uh, intertextuality. Well, we know, of course, that neither Nadezhda Mandelstam nor Karl Proffer were particularly um, you know, um, enamored of the intertextual, subtextual approach to, to Mandelstam. But nonetheless, I think this is part of the, of the wave that, that, was, that was taking uh, place then. Um, Someone like uh, I think so said the Kobo would say that the most important influences on, on the poets you know, in the 60s and 70s would be the rediscovery of late Mandelstam, probably Pasternak's Zhivago poems, and a lot of Svitaeva as well. So I think those are the three sort of key figures there. And other poets obviously were important, but, but, but not, not so, so much. Um, uh, with, with regards to uh, why some books were published in 
or why certain things are not published in English. I suspect, and others can answer this better than me, that the main factor would be the financial one. The books being published in English were the ones that more or less allowed the Russian language books to be published. Um, because if not a huge amount of profit could be made from those, that was at least a market, was the others were just being sent uh, to, uh, to the Soviet Union. So I suspect there was a financial um, component uh, there. Um, again, the connection or the comparing or the collating of the, uh, of the artist catalog with whether Putin's hundred books or something else like that. <laughs> to, to, go, to go back to issues of the canon would be, you know, be careful what one wishes for, but to, <laughs> but, but to see what would happen if we had this clash again of the prescriptive and proscriptive canons and lists of books to actually you know, see, see what the result of that would be. I mean, we probably don't, but uh, it, it might happen. Um, and I think connected with that, I mean, I, I, again, I don't know enough about the Overlook Press uh, project of all of these books, but my understanding was that there was some Russian state involvement in that, and that therefore there was a, at least a worry on the part of some people who talked about it, uh, that um, it might not be that dissimilar from Putin's 100 books, I don't know, or what the, select, what the selection criteria would be. So again, uh, but I'd, I'd need to know more about that, and perhaps we can be enlightened from, from the floor here. Um, and then, um, yes, the question of, of women writers, and obviously I think you know, Dershul Mandelstam, as so many people would agree, is one of the great writers of the 20th century, and um, if it turns out that uh, it was precisely you know, her anti-Soviet vision rather than Mandelstam's that really you know, was at the heart of things, and that, um, you know, uh, it's to her that we owe you know, uh, some, some of the most important critiques of the Soviet system, well, all well and good, um, you know, she gets the credit that we often perhaps give to Mandelstam, although again that's another side issue um, of the whole problem of his allegedly loyalist uh, later poetry. Um, and then what other issues were there? Uh, well, I think that's probably all, all I wanted to say, say at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. Before I open the floor to questions, of which I'm sure will be many, and I see one already from Professor Helt over there, so you get for prime of pride of place, Barbara. Let me remind you, first of all, of two other parts of this uh, uh, weekend. Uh, tomorrow, for another two-hour period, as today, there will be an exhibition on display in the uh, university's Harlan Hatcher Library. Those of you who haven't been to it already, I warmly recommend it to you. It is a, a small but very interesting selection of materials, uh, principally from the artist's archive excuse me, deposited with the university, but also some artist publications. And for our younger audience members, I think it would be worthwhile just looking at them to see what many of us grew up with. Uh, it, it will recreate materially the topic of discussion here. That uh, exhibition is open from 10.30 a.m. until 12.30 and is in what is, I learn now, called the Stephen S. Clark Library of the Hatcher uh, on the second floor. For those of us who are less oriented towards nomenclature, that's the map library. Um, at the end of the building. Uh, and then, of course, there will be a tribute, um, Ann Arbor on the Map of Russian Literature, a tribute to Karl Proffer, which will take place in the Rackham Amphitheater. I'm sure almost everyone in the audience knows this, but I feel an obligation to remind you all. That will begin at 1 and will run until 5.30 tomorrow afternoon. So I hope we'll see many of you there again. So now the floor is open to questions, and Barbara Helt, Professor Barbara Helt, has, wishes to pose the first question. I think, Barbara, the intention is that you should ask from there. Is that, is that correct? Okay, that's uh, perhaps not the right height for you, however, no. Barbara. <laughs> is, this, is this audible? Yes, it is. This right? Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody. You've been an excellent moderator, Michael Megan. My name is Barbara Held, and especially to have the idea to bring in the next generation who asked all the right questions. One which wasn't answered at all was about the often poor reviews that things in, published by artists, including in the RLT, got from the wider American academic world, which was a t very ossified world. I'll say more about this tomorrow. <coughs> um, and uh, <laughs> completely didn't get it. it we, you have to remember that most of our professors had never been to the Soviet Union. And we were a generation that were the first ones to go. And so they kind of resented this openness and, and picked nits. And that's part of the reason. The other is connected to what you asked about gender. And also, that wasn't completely answered <laughs> by the panel. I'd like to say something more. Um, what Alexander Delinin said 
about 1963 and gender wasn't an issue, they were all there. I spent six months in Leningrad in 1975 and because I was writing on Karolina Pavlova, uh, a book which I later published with artists, which was my translation and, uh, and introduction, um, and by the way, that's 19th century, so maybe that's not strictly within the, the canon we're talking about today, but I think it was an influence on 20th century writers. And it was great that the proffers published it and that it was since taken up by another publisher in Berkeley. But anyway, um, I went to all of these poetry readings in 1975, and they were all by men. And the names are well known and they've been written about. Uh, and I kept asking, well, because I had in mind to write a book about Russian women writers, where are the women writers, where are the Akhmatovas, the Leningrad women writers? And the only answer I would get was <laughs> from several people, oh, there's Ilyana Schwartz, but she's a drunk and she doesn't like men. <laughs> and I had a very difficult time trying to locate her. These were fairly dark years, so I didn't want to get anyone in trouble. But finally I found out her mother was the work was the uh Dramatur, the for the uh BDT. So I went there and she said, Oh yes, and gave me her phone number and I visited her a lot of times and she gave me manuscript poems. She had written one published thing, which was in a Tartu um, university journal called An Ode to the Old Age of Princess Dashkova, Nastaras Pinknik Dashkovi, and I thought it was wonderful. I thought it was better than any poem I had read. And so I asked her what more she had, and she gave me these manuscripts, and then Later, she became famous in her own right, but with no support from her co -evils. And she was a very nice person. She did drink to excess, but they all did. <laughs> um, unlike the men, unlike the men. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you're told that gender wasn't an issue, it's a bad sign when gender isn't an issue because it's being swept under the carpet. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Barbara. That, those, those of us who know you would have expected nothing less from you. Thank you very much for that intervention. Perhaps I could ask someone actually to adjust that microphone a little bit so that anyone else of a <coughs> smaller stature can, uh, can manage the microphone more easily than Barbara did. So, Herb, is that your desire to ask a question? Yeah, that sounds like a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make a couple of comments, although they, they certainly could elicit responses. Could you introduce responses. yourself? Yes, Herb Eagle. Uh, I'm a, a professor in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures here at Michigan. Um, first, I, I think a number of the speakers have pointed out that economic considerations surely played a role in the prose versus poetry and what gets published in English and other such questions. Perhaps the academic market played a role in the contents of the anthologies that uh, it might have been thought uh, uh, wise to include some of the uh, writers, prominent writers, morally acceptable, you could say, who were being published in the, in the Soviet Union, just to give a broader perspective, I, I think. I, I would certainly imagine that a number of these anthologies got used as texts in courses on contemporary Russian literature. The other thing I wanted to point out that I wonder whether, so I think that the, the artist book list overall is not exactly Karl Proper's view of the, of the Russian uh, literary canon of the 20th century, that the two should be distinguished. But the second point is whether this is just Karl Proper's personal canon um, at whose canon is this? And I think this has been alluded to as well, particularly in connection with Brodsky. But it is true that some of the writers that artists published were also Karl Proffer's colleagues in artists. That is to say, they were also, I, I don't 
know too much about the internal organization titles and so forth of the artist's operation once it got to be a fair size to say what these people's roles are, but they were clearly also part of the editorial process and, and played a role, uh, I would imagine, in decisions as to what to publish. So you have some of the writers and poets who are being published perhaps also influencing proffers uh, decisions on who else to publish and, and who they recommend. So it's a, it's a canon formed not just by Carl and Ellen Dea, but by a kind of sort of a circle of people that could almost be some kind of tree maybe. Uh, and then it, I think in the end it does represent a canon with a certain um, nature to it, certain angles to it, but formed perhaps more by a uh, group of people rather than single individuals. So that's just a comment. Thank you, Herb. Could I invite further questions from the floor? Professor Smith? We'll need to readjust that microphone up for you, Jerry. <laughs> For, for, <laughs> for the very youngest people here, please don't forget to introduce yourself. Jerry. Thank you very much. My name is Jerry Smith. I'm from Oxford. I want to just say two things very briefly and try not to anticipate anything I intend to say tomorrow afternoon. One is, we're speaking, I've got the sensation now that we're speaking into an enormous void and letting a huge context which exists in my memory, but in a fading way, which is, artist wasn't built on a, a open site. There were dozens, literally, of other publishers producing uh, Russian literature outside Russia at the time. There's the whole emigre press and the various state institutions that got into the game in the 50s and 60s. And to talk about the artist canon uh, in isolation makes no sense at, at all. It was built, I suspect, as much as it, if anything else, in opposition to an existing canon that uh, had been produced by other publishers in the 50s and 60s. Um, but that's a huge topic, and I wish somebody had ever written even an, uh, a bibliography of Western publications of uh, Russian literature before Arnis. If we saw that, we maybe know really what we were talking about. And the same thing with the bi bibliography of Russian translations. Uh, there's not only that, but there's the whole scholarly press, which uh, in English language scholarly press, which started in the West, really in the late 50s, and got going uh, incrementally as the 60s went on. Anyway, that's one broad remark of, uh, to try and contextualize this. The other thing is, I want to put in a word for one of my very favorite artist books, which uh, has not been mentioned, and this is not uh, a criticism of what's been said by the people here, because it's not in your remit. But what it has to say impinges on, on all the discussions, that you, the, the papers and the discussions, almost in every particular. And that's uh, Violin Gaines's Shisnissiatu. Uh, one of the very best books that Charlie's ever published, and one that I wish people would read to try and recapture the atmosphere seen from a Russian point of view with the emigrant of what the situation was actually like when uh, artists came into the consciousness of uh, Russian people. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. Perhaps I could be forgiven for a quick remark from the podium, which is apropos of what Jerry and Barbara both said. I remember so very clearly as an undergraduate uh, in the, I think it was the Taylor Library, or I've even forgotten what the other library is called now. I've not been there for oh, so No, 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 the other Modern Languages Library. I do remember the Bodley. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm <clears throat> well, that, that was also after my time, but don't, never mind. <laughs> don't make me feel so old. The Taylor, thank you, the Taylor. I remember in the Taylor, my absolute astonishment when I first leafed through RLT. And then gradually discovering in bookstores, building my own library, and across the university libraries, all these artists' publications. For me, at least, it's important, apropos of what Barbara and Jerry said, to understand that artist was, of course, in response to lots of other things. But artist was so different. Artist was not run by Russian emigres. It was run by Americans. It published in English as well as in Russian. It published a lot in English, uh, publications that I found rather puzzling as an 
English undergraduate, but when I came here to teach in an American, an American university, I understood a lot more. It published with wit. It, 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 was a, it, it occupied a transitional space. RLT was an astonishing, remarkable, not entirely academic publication. No wonder it got such strange reviews. Artists did different things, and if we look at those reviews 20 years later, 30 years later, it's kind of Im important to understand that, that m maybe some of the criticisms were right from a scholarly point of view, from an academic point of view, but artists, as I understand it, had a very different mission and fulfilled that mission very differently, and that's one of the reasons why we're in this room today, I think. Anyway, sorry, that was an inappropriate misuse of my time at the, uh, <laughs> at the podium. <laughs> uh, but thank you for indulging me. Uh, yes, please come to the come to the microphone and announce yourself and ask a question. Hi, I'm Ron Meyer. I worked at Artists from 1981 to 1991. I'm now at Columbia University where I teach translation. To follow up on, on what Michael just said, <coughs> Artists was different not only in the, in the subject matter in the authors, but also in the presentation. I mean, aesthetically, it was very very different. The covers, the pictures. Uh, if you took any YMCA book yeah. and compared it with the artist book, you, you could tell from 20 feet away which was which. <laughs> so that was one, <coughs> and that was really Ellen Dea's contribution to the, yeah. whole, to the whole effort. Um, to go back to your question about uh, Overlook and, and uh, the Russian Library, I'm on the Russian Library board, so I can tell you a few things. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is going out live. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're right in that there is some support from um, the press agents in, in Moscow. Uh, Overlook uh, hasn't announced when it's going to begin yet. They've only announced so far an advisory board um, and no titles have been chosen. But it's not going to be little known titles. It will also include Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and, and Gogol. Starting from the lay of eager up until the last week is the, is the plan. How they managed to do this, I don't know. Um, and following that, um, we're talking about the, the artists, Russian and English catalogs. It was the English translations which paid our salaries. I mean, those copies of Envy that went out every spring were what we lived on. Um, so, I mean, that was the, the important. Of, of, of that. And that's where I started my own translation career. And, uh, with uh, Carl and Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. That's my order. This is your own forum. <laughs> I have a brief question for Professor Kozlo. And actually, it's about the disagreements between uh, Professor Daginian and Professor Kozlov about uh, the emergence of nationalism. Um, you know, in re we know, we all know that nationalism is a very elusive word. And uh, we imply ve very many different things when we say nationalism. So maybe, and I agree with you that some precursors or some early expressions of nationalism might be traced back to the 50s and the 60s. Um, though it, wa it was more um, vivid articula uh, vividly articulated in the 70s. So my main question is, how would you, uh, what words would you use uh, to define these two different nationalisms, uh, uh, to make them, uh, to make the phenomena that you discuss more precise, because nationalism is a very broad, very elusive um, words, and uh, to what extent? And Bilov, even published in Novi Mir, uh, might not be perceived by many readers as uh, nationalist. Uh, at all, but as a as a vo as an outlet for the ordinary people, as the as their voice. Um, and my second question for you uh, is about uh, letters of uh, readers' letters that, in a way, prepared what the writers implemented. Um, and you raised the broader issue of cultural mechanisms, how cultural 
uh, how intellectual trends change. Um, I think one very important issue that brings us back to artists uh, is uh, maybe it's part of your broader project, but it, uh, it was not articulated here. One of the very important issues are people who were released from camps at that time and uh, during the Doe and, uh, and the following years. And they brought a new understanding of what was going on in uh, the Soviet Union at that time. So to what extent their contribution uh, kind of influenced uh, or, or, or was part of mm -hmm. this uh, mechanism of change. And some of their memoirs, some of their words were published by artists and influenced many of us who grew in the Soviet Union to a great extent. Okay. Thank you very much for two excellent questions. Um, with regard to nationalism, um, uh, this is not the major focus of my uh, project, uh, but, um, and I would not make a clear distinction between two different nationalisms, one of the 60s, the other of the 70s. I would consider them rather as parts of the same continuum. But if a distinction were to be made, uh, it uh, would be in my mind between that and the nationalism of the 80s, where from cultural topics, village prose, etc., etc., it moved more and more into the political realm became increasingly aggressive um, and virulent. There we do see some of the distinction, perhaps, although still I would not define these as two different nationalisms. And with regard to your second question, um, it's a wonderful one. And um, in the book, I actually address this question extensively. The camp returnees had uh, a major impact on uh, Solzhenitsyn. Let me give you a very specific example. Um, he, to a considerable extent, based the Gulag Archipelago on uh, readers' letters uh, in response to one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. He tracked down those readers and interviewed them, many of them, in fact. And uh, there was a chapter in the Gulag Archipelago that did not end up included in the book. It was published separately, I believe, by Leopold Labitz. Uh, and it was published a couple of years even before the publication of the, Ar the Gulag Archipelago itself, but it had initially been meant to be there. And it was his assessment of those letters and some of those letter writers and his commentaries, quite moralistic, some of them, about the letter writers. Um, but it's, uh, it, it cannot be denied that he used a lot of this information and based his major project on the, those letters. And the readers actually, when they responded to One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, they specifically, many of them specifically, urged him to make it bigger, to create an overwhelming, overarching history of the terror. And that's what he exactly did in the Gulag Archipelago. So that, that, that is the best example to my mind. About nationalism, uh, we should remember uh, actually, there were uh, two, maybe three kinds of nationalism uh, simultaneously. We should remember that uh, Stalin dumped into nationalism uh, in 1939 or 38, and uh, that Stal Stalin nationalism was the fact. And so this nationalism, Chelmayev or say Shif Ivan Shivtsov, nationalism of the 60s uh, was still a part of Stalinism as such. And that is why Novi Mir uh, attacked sarcastically, as you mm -hmm. said, mm -hmm. this kind of Stalinism nationalism. On the other uh, hand, well, Solzhenitsyn's Matryonin Dvor, which actually was the germ of the future national, Russian nationalism, anti-Stalinist nationalism, was published in Novi Mir. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -mm -mm, Again, even then, it was not perceived as a kind of a nationalist statement. It was perceived as an anti-Stalinist uh, uh, statement, very powerful story discussed and embraced by liberals at that time. 
So uh, that's probably the difference. Chilmaev and Mladaj Gvardia of that time on one side, they were perceived as Stalinists mm -hmm. rather than nationalists. That's what I wanted to add to that. Into your interesting discussion. I, I, I think that, that there is, a di of course, there is this history of Russian nationalists written by Nikolai Mitrokhin in his Russian party, the Russian party yeah, yes. which, which is an incredibly informative book. Um, but, but I think uh, that, that Chilmaev and that nationalism of the late 60s was, was somewhat different from, from st st late Stalin's period nationalism. Although it it's used same rhetorics but for a different end because Chilmaev's uh, articles were basically anti-Soviet. Uh, and he was criticizing Soviet regime from the nationalist, sometimes Slavophilic uh, standpoint. And basically, his main, his and Labanov's main uh, object of attack were liberals who have distorted uh, national canon. And that's why exactly Belov became the center of attention. Um, I, uh, I remember in criticism, there was this huge discussion between the uh, critics of Novomir uh, and, and uh, Maldai Gvardia and others, while uh, the, the latter were creating an icon out of um, Ivan Afrikanovich and to a less extent from the uh, Alyosha in, in Plotinsky Raskazi. And uh, I, I remember how Igor Dutkov wrote on the pages of Novomir that, that when I'm uh, reading these critical articles, I think that we have read two different works. Right? And so, so, of course, Bilov was having very complex picture, it was crit criticism and idealization at both ends. And uh, so sort of the nationalist group, which was there already, uh, they were trying to, to idealize it. And I would disagree with, with Denise that it was mainly literary and not political. Of course, political all along, but it was sort of using uh, literary subjects for, for disguise or for, for for ability to, to publish the, the, these works, but of course it was political. And uh, maybe the turning point was 1979 with this infamous discussion, Classic KME, when, when the, the, the actual split of intelligentsia happened, yeah, right this along with this. It was in the 90s, yeah. uh, 70s, 79, 79, 79, 79 rather than 60s. Yeah. But, but 60, that, that was the process. The context was different, that's what my point mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, may I invite another question from the floor? May I then pose a question? Maybe that would encourage some more volunteers. We talked a lot about these problems of canon, and of course they're very complicated, and artists is a very specific case. As a speaker here some years ago, who has not been mentioned today, once said, Russian literature is a, of this period was not only very personalna, but also very personajna. I thought that was a rather good definition, and it helps us to understand perhaps some of the kind of undercurrents that we're working with here. It's intriguing as we look back, to think that what we might call the neo-avant-garde of the post-war years, mm -hmm. uh, and it did exist in, even in the 40s, of course, and 50s, uh, was completely underground. But for me, this was completely unknown territory until, goodness, until certainly I was a graduate student, and maybe long after that for the most part. And it didn't, of course, really touch artists for reasons that people have speculated on. Um, but is it entirely frivolous to suggest that a lot of the people associated with Leon Norzeba, the precursors of, of conceptualism, had no aspiration to be published. Is that, is that, is that a totally frivolous, and, and, and um, uh, this is a question obviously for the SCN and, and, and Reynolds, is that a totally frivolous suggestion that they deliberately cut themselves off from any question of publication and this kind of public discourse? Um, May, may I begin? Uh, the, there is a clear answer to this question in Ardis's publication. There is uh, one of the Almanachs published right after Metropol was uh, catalog, which included huge publication by Prigov, uh, which which and, and this publication was actually uh, his his uh, sort of a geography. He he did, uh, attempted to present his entire aura. In, in, in 20 pages, so he obviously wanted to be published. But is already a different generation. Yeah, but, but he was basically, in my view at least, the ideologue of that very circle, because um, when we read his uh, interviews and his articles, he emphasized that for us it was completely impossible even to think about publishing right. in the Soviet press. So, so the publication in Soviet press was no, no, but Argus was a different story, I guess, for all of them. 
I would assume. But maybe Andrew has no, a different I, take I, on that. I think we review that. Again, I think there are a number of factors uh, taking place here. That, as, as you suggest, a lot of this is to do with networking and personal contacts, and there's always the focus on Moscow and Leningrad anyway. So if you're not part of those you know, sort of two capitals, then you're already less likely to be, um, to be included in you know, even the possibility of, of getting published. Um, I mean, I just wonder whether in some ways um, I mean, so poets can come to quite strength at quite a young age, but maybe they've not been on the scene for so long, therefore they have not made the contact, so certainly not the contact so much abroad or with the academic community. So they, they were somehow, as, as you were suggesting, Michael, you know, these things were not really on our radar. There was such a rich culture, and yet somehow hardly anyone was aware of it. You know, even, even the best, the most knowledgeable Western scholars weren't aware of it, and a lot of people in Russia were obviously not aware of it. So uh, it might simply be that there is no sort of strange conspiracy here. It's just that they were not being picked up upon. Um, I guess there might be some cases as well that um, poetry publications, perhaps the Samizdat uh, typescripts were not very reliable, and you couldn't uh, offer them forward you know, to be republished. Um, it may also be that poetry, in some ways, was thought less in need of that help because it had a greater sort of self defensive mechanism, self-preservation by being recited, easier to reprint, to publish, and so on and so forth. So it, it had its own uh, sort of subculture, which, which somehow you know, persisted in, in a better way. So those, those would just be some of my speculations. I think it's a very important thing that it, it was very much predicated upon performance, a lot of yes. this work, and it didn't have the same need for publication, perhaps, I'd suggest, as prose did. It, could be, it was disseminated individually by authors, and it didn't need the printed page in quite the same way, perhaps. Anyway. Yes, please, Misha, come to the microphone, and don't forget to introduce yourself to our worldwide audience. <coughs> and you'll have to raise the microphone again, I'm afraid. Thank you. <laughs> okay, my name is Mikhail Kotick, I'm here at the University of Michigan. And actually, what I want to ask, I guess, it's a sort of a rider on my last question. Maybe I'll try to reformulate it. And uh, <laughs> I don't you. know what answer we can get. The question is whether in that underground landscape there were still people who kind of resisted being brought up and published by places like artists. I would imagine that Jan Sotnowski, for example, I think he, yes. he never wanted to be right. published right, to begin right. with. But there are other people who would object or somehow disagree with artists' sort of emphasis on that specific kind of modernism. In other words, did we, if we look at all this publishing houses, right? Uh, official, non-official, doesn't cover the whole landscape, or there is still some margins where you'd find people who would be, who would not think that that was their natural haunt, would be looking for something different, uh, I mean, both in prose and poetry. It's a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> writers inside the Soviet Union, the choice would be Mike. between uh, uh, artists yeah. and uh, uh, continent. Yeah. M mostly. Uh, and nothing else. Uh, uh, there was some syntaxes and passive. Yeah. Uh, right. uh, passive, they the were slim, small. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't publish a long, long novel, for example. Echa. Echa. Echa existed for what? Three years. Uh, three years. Yeah. 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 Published um, avant-garde. Yeah. Well, it's well, just yeah. coming out now. Yeah. He, and he could have, I mean, easily could have published, right? He could be. Yeah. He didn't want to, right? So Donovsky is another example. So, so, like, yeah. Obviously, there were some example. other names, I mean, just don't come to my mind, but yeah. there are probably other people who would be in the woods and not want to come out, right? Yeah. But definitely. And Pavel Zaltzman is, is a great example of the same uh, United War with his, yeah. his blockade. Uh, Poetry, so of course there, there, there would be there would be such such writers, but um, I and and, and uh, probably they're exactly those who are at the center of publication efforts these days. Sort of what what we are sort of discovering from from the uh, Nikolov, for instance, and, and although he was Nikolov, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, and so so he wasn't there, but but still. Um, I, th I think that, 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 that that's a very hypothetical question. It's, it's really hard to uh, prove, and we should ask Alan there if they approached anyone who, who's, who said, no, I don't want to be published in, in art. Is that, that's, that's the best way to answer this question, I guess. <laughs> Michael? 
my guess would be that there were some who were just afraid. Yeah. Not for aesthetical reason, <laughs> because it was a, 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 a wrong canon, but because of the political situation and repercussions that come all the consequences. It was really dangerous. But at the same time, we can see implications of very officially safe writers like Zaligin. And, and uh, so, so definitely a person like Zaligin wouldn't permit himself to be published in Ardis without any permission, right? So, so the, <laughs> there were something, some, some negotiations probably. We can again only guess about it. If there are no more questions from the floor, and this is your opportunity to be the last questioner or speaker, then I would like to invite uh, Professor Mayorova to conclude what is essentially her forum, I should emphasize, as the director of the uh, Center for Russian and East European Studies. Thank you very much, Olga. Thank you, Michael. Very brief closing remarks. First of all, I've, of course, I want to thank uh, the workshop participants for their engaging presentations and insightful answers, responses, the di dialogues, and uh, to um, specifically highlight how the young generation contributed to the, di to the discussion and um, uh, kind of ignited some, uh, some, made it more vivid, the discussion. Um, many thanks for those who contributed to the discussion with questions and remarks. I think we had a very productive and interesting day. And please join us tomorrow afternoon for our second session, um, Ann Arbor on the map of Russian literature, a tribute to Karl Proffer. It will begin tomorrow at 1 p.m. sharp in Rackham Amphitheater. And I'm sure it will be even more engaging discussion than today. Thank you very much and hope to see you tomorrow.